The next example of a um, country that is not democratic, not a non-democratic political system, uh, is uh, China. So, what should we know very, very briefly about the long and uh, rich history of China uh, from the perspective of the current uh, state, the modern state, and uh, where it is now? <clears throat> well, obviously, it's a very long history, as I mentioned, very rich. But, of course, just like in the case of the other states we have mentioned, you know, the so-called China, you know, is a, you know, is a development, you know. There is no such thing as a China that has existed forever, right? So, actually, the history of that territory is a history of continued tension between fragmentation, which is obvious, because in a large territory you'll have different cultures and groups and centers of, powers, uh, of power developing. Um, and vying with each other. So there were many periods in Chinese history, let's call it broadly that, because even within, you know, so-called Chinese, there are different subcultures, you all know Mandarin, Cantonese, and many, many others. But, <clears throat> uh, the history is one of tension, continued tension between fragmentation uh, and different, um, for example, in many periods you would have warlords ruling over the territory and buying and fighting with each other, so instability. So this tension between instability and uh, trying to establish a more uh, centralized uh, source of rule. And in fact, one of the uh, f major figures in history uh, is uh, the first, so-called first emperor um, uh, of uh, who, who was the first to unify uh, these uh, these territories, um, Shi Huangdi. Right, this is 221 uh, BC, right, so that's uh, 2,200 years ago. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's the first time when, when uh, he unified his territories by force, and he was actually a brutal uh, ruler, um, and you know of him because of the Great Wall of China, you know of him because of the t famous terracotta, uh, terracotta uh, army, you know, of uh, soldiers, right, uh, buried with the emperor, you know, thousands of soldiers made out of clay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, there are many works written about him, but it is a good example of the fact that the attempt to create uh, a unified control over a territory obviously needs uh, violence. Um, what else um, should we mention also, uh, perhaps that throughout history there has been, you know, um, just like in other, the case of other uh, areas, like the neighboring Indian Peninsula, uh, you would have um, different forces acting and taking control over the territory. For example, the Mongols ruled, uh, quote-unquote, China for uh, quite a long time. Uh, so, fragmentation versus unification versus centralization, um, being at the crossroads of empires, so to speak, on the crossroads of different influences. Obviously, later, uh, in the... Uh, the second part of the second millennium, you would have the European uh, powers uh, establishing colonies there, including in <coughs> the, the Chinese territories, um, and you would have Portuguese, you would have well, basically everyone. The British, of course, were an important uh, presence, and when, as we get slowly to the 20th century, um, uh, by the way, China has a history of uh, Dynastic rule and uh, the the, late, the last dynasty actually ruled for um, the King Dynasty. Well, ruled, controlled part of the territory. Right? It uh, was the center of power uh, between 1644 and 1911. <coughs> so you know, for 300 years basically. Uh, but again, rule is a stretch because, for example, the British were uh, at certain points very important participants and more important. Uh, presence than the so-called ruler and so on. But you had a dynasty, right? You had this idea of an absolute ruler. Um, so as you get closer to the 20th century, uh, you have conflicts, and uh, for example with the, some of the colonial powers of the British, <coughs> there's a so famous uh, opium wars fought between <coughs> the Chinese and, uh, and the British, very destructive. Um, but one of the key challenges uh, of all states, basically, is uh, how they respond to the formation of the modern state. Well, let me do this here. All challenges of all political entities that existed in the 18th, 19th century 
um, was how to respond to the demands of the modern uh, state. Modern state, which was, uh, I'm, you know, broadly speaking, modern state. I mentioned, I mean by this both the modern nation state, also industrialization, uh, capitalist economy, te technology, all these things. So the challenge of modernity, right, and hence the word modernization. Uh, which means, you know, bringing up to date, whatever that date is. And um, especially, so, so this applies to the Ottoman Empire, for example, uh, the Middle East, for example, Russia, uh, and China, and Japan, for example. So all of these uh, uh, countries which, for example, China was fairly isolated, Japan even more so, but they were faced, uh, the Ottoman Empire as well, but they were faced with this challenge of well, there are these, there's this very thriving, prosperous, aggressive, technologically developed culture, basically Western European mostly. So, what should we do, right? And then uh, the response was to, were, were different attempts to modernization. Japan, for example, modernized successfully, but modernized successfully in the wrong way because it developed economically, but also developed as an aggressive military power. And that led to World War II, and we all know what, what it is. <clears throat> what happened then? Uh, similar to Germany, Japan actually took Germany as a model. And Germany, the Germany of the 1870 to basically World War II, World War One, then World War Two was an aggressive militaristic Germany, you know. uh, but it was very successful at modernizing and creating a centralized state. So China, Ch you know, the Chinese territories were faced by the same challenge, and it's not by surprise that the two, some of the responses that were developed. Let me just list them, right? So this is in, end of the 19th century. We need to put in reforms to modernize the state, create a, a centralized bureaucracy, administration, right? Uh, a Weberian, you know, rational, reorganized uh, bureaucracy. Uh, <coughs> and all that, right? To so reform the legal system. Change it. Um, so the first attempt was done by the emperor. The emperor was, you know, the, the absolute ruler. He could imp introduce such policies. But, you know, every such policy that tries to throw out the entire existing ways of life and, and ways of governing and elites, right, uh, is not easy to implement. And yes, it didn't last long because he is actually, um, was it his mother or his, his stepmother, uh, removed him basically from power and uh, with the help of the elites who opposed these reforms, basically pulled everything back. The problem is they couldn't, you know, <laughs> These, uh, this process of modernization was still needed. These, the tensions in the society were there as well. You know, all these, all these forces that have created a modern state in Western Europe and North America, for example, also acted everywhere else. You know, we talked about the fact that this is the you know model, and it's a successful model. Why is it a su successful model, by the way? Parenthesis, right? Because the modern state, right, is a centralized state. Even if it's a federal, the organized one, it's centralized in the sense that it has a strong central government. Even a federal system like the U.S. or Germany, the, the central government is is able to mobilize the entire state with one the center of command. But that gives it the power to act in a unitary manner <coughs> and efficiency. Right? So this is why it became a successful model because it it also is successful because it creates a space of a regulated space, a space of order, because it, the institutions of the state penetrate, right? The administration penetrates every single nook and cranny of the society. We talked about that when we talked about the administration. And that allows the state to create, to impose its order. Again, the tension between order and disorder, right? Uh, political order. And political order needs institutions, right? And an idea, uh, well, a system of ideas. So it's very successful. So how to do that, right? How to do that, and how to do that in a in a territory that is such a gigantic territory like uh, you know the Chinese uh, territories, um, China, quote unquote, uh, where today there are, live a bit one billion people, one billion people, so of different cultures and even languages and everything. So how do you do that, right? That's a challenge. So anyway, the the emperor's reforms failed, were actually thwarted by the elites uh, who tried to impose a sort of this feudal quasi, it wasn't feudalism like in Western Europe, but a sort of feudal system in the Chinese equivalent. Uh, but all these forces of pushing towards, uh, you know, um, 
social reforms, you know, um, uh, all the things that created a modern democratic uh, state in Western Europe also acted there. So the tensions grew in a society and two forces emerged with the gradual breakdown of the empire, uh, which ended in 1911, and one was a nationalistic force, as you see, like in modernity, these are the typical modern response, the ideology of nationalism, right? So there was a nationalistic party and group, and then there were the communists. Exactly, you see, two hard ideologies from the 19th century emerged as a response to unsolved tensions in the society. Similar thing within Russia, the beginning of the 20th century, where you have the Communist October Revolution, which happened in November, actually, in <clears throat> 1917, right? Why? Because there were these unsolved tensions in the society to which the governing authority, the Tsar, did not, wasn't able to answer satisfactorily. So the whole society break, broke, broke down, and instead of having a gradual reform as you had in, the, in Britain, you have an explosion, a revolution. Well, that, that's also what happens in China. So after World War One, basically, China is torn apart by these two forces. Uh, and in fact, the nationalists actually take power for about uh, two, two decades. But then World War II comes, uh, Japanese invasion. Meanwhile, the, China, the communists are also rising. They're actually fighting the nationalists. So China is torn between the nationalists and the communists uh, in, in the, between the two wars. Then World War II comes and they fight together the common enemy, the Japanese, and uh, who occupy part of China and so on, a very, very brutal occupation. Um, the famous rape of Nanking, of a city. There's a movie about that. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, but when World War II ends, the, the conflict reunites between the nationalists and the communists. Uh, and uh, the nationalists, the communists, well, the nationalists have been in power and they have introduced reforms, but not satisfactory. Not, it wasn't uh, satisfactory. Again, uh, and the, the, the level of organization and discipline of the nationalists was not as, 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 uh, as good as the communists, who were motivated by ideology and so on. The so-called People's Liberation Army, right? uh, which was the army of the communists. And as you see, that's also the name of the current army in China. <coughs> so in 1949, the communists overwhelm the nationalists, take the capital city and the nationalists uh, basically escape from the mainland to a neighboring island, uh, Taiwan. And that's the birth of Taiwan, which was considered to be um, just a temporary uh, capital of China of the mainland. That actually Taiwan was called, it still considered, calls itself China. So Taiwan calls itself China, and for 20, 30 years, China as such, the People's Republic of China, the Communist China, was not recognized. Uh, and it was not a member of the UN, the United Nations. It was Taiwan, its government sort of in exile, which is off the mainland, uh, which calls itself China, the original China uh, that wasn't taken over by communists, and that, that had uh, the membership in the UN. And now, then, it has, then it switched in the 70s. So now the People's Republic of China has a, has a recognition of everything. So, um, in any case, for 1949, Taiwan is this, uh, you know, uh, state, you know, this is where the nationalists seek refuge and say, no, no, we're just a government in exile of China, this is China. Uh, but, but the communists actually take mainland China. And this is why there's this tension between Taiwan and China, because both consider themselves to be, you know, you know, the, the China, you know. Taiwan just, you know, we're the capital of the entire China, and China says, well, Taiwan is just an island of the mainland, mainland right? So we are China. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, uh, tension, tension situation. Uh, but you see, it's, it's two states that were born of, a, of an ideological difference, you know. And they're both Chinese, you know, whatever Chinese means, right? Uh, <clears throat> so then you have communism. Obviously under Mao, the famous uh, chairman Mao Zedong. Um, and remember that you have a textbook section uh, scanned on canvas which uh, you, you should read uh, together with, with, uh, with this lecture to give you the background because I can only point some things out. Uh, communism uh, uh, starts basically in 1949, People's Republic of China, that's the name of the state we're talking about, People's Republic. Remember it was the Islamic Republic in, of Iran, this is the People's Republic of China. Names matter and this means something, as you see why. 
And then under Mao, China basically was a totalitarian regime. A totalitarian regime, remember what that means, uh, a communist government that governed uh, completely the lives of their citizens to a degree that probably is very hard to imagine for most of us. Uh, uh, and some, some, some of the moments that are very illustrative that illustrate this uh, type of regime and control was the, for example, the Great Leap Forward in between 1958 and 1960. The Great Leap Forward was an attempt to literally uh, throw the Chinese society and economy into the future, like jumpstart it, uh, you know, Great Leap Forward, right? Uh, <clears throat> but completely, arb in a completely arbitrary way. For example, all the villages were forced to become industrial economic units. So what resulted obviously was famine, because <laughs> no one was making food. But simply, you know, it, it was this idea that all will just industrialize overnight. And literally the villagers had to collect uh, uh, steel and, and uh, metals and whatever and f have little forges in their village, which was obviously not, you know, no, no, technolo no technology, no technological know-how right, or uh, no tools <laughs> that were appropriate, so these makeshift things and everybody was producing steel, well, I don't know why, um, but, uh, and of bad quality, which was in, unusable, you know, because the order came down that you have to do this, right, uh, so that resulted in famine and the destruction of the, uh, you know, countries, countryside and so on, and millions of people, you know, suffering from that and dying and so on. Uh, just, and this is 1958-60, only six years later you have between 66 and 76, uh, the whole decade, but especially the middle of that decade, there was the Cultural Revolution. But that's another attempt to, uh, you see, why? Communism is what? It's a hard ideology, right? It's an ideology in the hard sense that I mentioned, right? Uh, which, which means what? Which means that it tries to, it proposes, it uh, uh, imposes and proposes <clears throat> to establish uh, a utopia, an ideal, an ideal city on earth, an ideal uh, society, an ideal political system, right? An ideal political system uh, based on a specific explanation of reality, right? That's what ideologies do. They propose a utopia and they use political tools, the, arm, the, the instruments of politics, of the political system of the state, to bring about that change in, in uh, human condition, basically. In society, politics, but actually human condition. And what is the essential, you know, ideology, what is the essence of communism, we talked about it, but just briefly, right, is the idea of um, class warfare, right, the, the oppression of those who don't have by those who have. <clears throat> so that's, that's what determines history. And if you remove property from this equation, if you remove the, the ability to have things, to own things, uh, and put it in the hands of everyone, quote-unquote, which is usually the state, not everyone, um, then uh, you remove, you know, the problem. And obviously, he, here you have to battle enemies, and the enemies are those who have, or those who don't change their thinking. And here it is the trick, because how do you know who has changed their thinking, you know? How do you know who is the enemy? We talked about this. Uh, so you're going to use the instruments of the state to bring about this change, and you know you're going to have enemies who oppose you, so the, the instruments of the state will be used to, well, quote-unquote, persuade them, uh, or eliminate them. Um, because what you're trying to do is, you have a narrative, you have a story about reality that doesn't, reality doesn't fit it. And, but because you know, you have a story about reality that you say, well, no, no, this is how it should be, and I know exactly everything, in every single detail, how this should be. So, uh, since you're convinced that that's the right narrative about reality, and you, your task is to take control of the instruments of the state to bring that reality about. This is why ideologies result in violence, because, and this is also why uh, ideologies, in the hard sense, right, <clears throat> this is why ideologies could only happen, actually, uh, in a modern state, because only the modern state has the tools that administrative arms, the administrative uh, instruments, to control a territory and a membership. Remember that before, you didn't have that, even if, you know, someone came up with an ideology you know, during the feudal times, I mean, you don't have the tools to implement it, you don't have the tools to control uh, a society, you know, you simply don't, because for that you need institutions. And you, in the modern state, 
draws the lines and says, these are the borders, this is the nation, quote unquote, this is the government, right? So that's it, the government can control both quote, uh, the, the nation and, and the territory. Uh, with what? With the instruments of, uh, with all the institutions from administration to police to uh, army to all these things which control and, uh, every single inch of the territory and every single basically inch of their life. Yeah. So modern ideologies, this is why they're there, they have such results uh, like you know fascism, communism, uh, whatever, nationalism, because they have the power of the, of the state that they're just, and that's very important, um, as it takes us to today, well, so I was saying about the Cultural Revolution, that was another attempt to, 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 to bring about such a radical change in human nature, basically, you know, Cultural Revolution, to change thinking, to change the way people, human beings think, you know, to change culture, top down, with the instruments of the state. And that again resulted in millions of people die, dying and being arrested and, and so on. Uh, it was basically a throwing out of the old and bringing in of the new, but what is the new? Well, at that point it was basically, uh, it wasn't clear, right? So it resulted at a certain point of, of gangs of students actually, you know, chasing down teachers they didn't like to th throw out the old and beating them to death. That's actually, you know, things that happened. It's sort of a purges, but since it wasn't organized, it was just an ideological order, so basically you would have gangs of people who you know, would arbitrarily decide that this is a guy who hasn't changed his thinking, <laughs> his, uh, his way of uh, thinking. Uh, so that, you know, was your end, basically. And it, because it was, it was uncoordinated, it resulted in, you know, chaos. So the, the country was on the brink of falling apart yet again, and the, the military actually intervened and um, uh, put some order into the society. Because, you know, it was chaos, it was civil war. And that's all in the 70s. Um, but then, you know, the party again took the reins of uh, control of the reins of power, uh, eliminated some of Mao's, you know, circle, including his wife, who have orchestrated these whole uh, events. Mao died. Mao wasn't really eliminated because he was still the leader, you know, the, the one who has established the state, you know, he's a father of the state, a framer, you know. Um, but also uh, an ideological leader, but he dies of natural causes. And then, this is at the end of the 70s, in the 80s, you have a change uh, in which uh, the Communist um, Party uh, decides to step away from being so rigidly ideological in all aspects of life. So they, uh, for example, start to be more relaxed about, for example, the economy. And this is why today you have an economy there that resembles market economy, so you have a sort of market mechanisms and so on. Still not free market, because, you know. But it's still a market, you know, it works on the principles of, of, of profit and, and, and so on, uh, <coughs> unlike in other communist countries, but not politically. So you have some freedom of action, quote-unquote, in the economic sense, but not in the political uh, sense. Uh, the problem is when you open a little bit the door, you know, you, re you open the door of, and you release a little bit um, of uh, the oppression, you know, uh, of the society, other forces also come up to the surface, and that happened in 1989, just like the year when communism fell in uh, Central Eastern Europe, and also in the USSR. Uh, in China also there was the famous Tiananmen Square in Beijing, uh, protests, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, which also, which were brutally crushed. Really crushed there were some iconic uh, videos and pictures about the Tiananmen Square in 1989. So the attempt to reform, to change the system, to uh, get rid of the degree of communism failed. So what you have now, today, is a, is a communist uh, state. But one that, again, still uh, is, is pragmatic economically, because it says, well, let's just have stability on an economic success economically, you know, whatever it takes, even if it takes market economy, which goes against the whole of <laughs> principle, and then, but ideologically you, do, you don't have uh, any relaxation, basically. Ideologically it's still controlled and so on. So the question is, is it a totalitarian state or an authoritarian state? Um, well, it's in between. It's in between. 
Iran was in between, but China is also in between. Uh, it depends on what aspect of life uh, we're talking about. So, uh, today's Chinese state, and let's look at the institutions to see why and how China is not a liberal democracy. Uh, the state, so, as I said, the population of 1.3 billion people, world's second largest population, uh, fourth largest country in terms of size, so it's a huge, huge task to govern. Now again, I, 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 I kept saying, you know, quote-unquote China, because again, it's more complicated than that. Um, there are plenty of uh, regions and uh, uh, cultural, social, uh, ethnic groups that are not Chinese, and even the quote-unquote Chinese, are, there are different uh, uh, groups there. There's the Han, there's the and so on, the different languages, the Cantonese, Mandarin, and so on, but also many ethnic minorities, because they're regions that China has occupied, Tibet, right, Tibet is famous for, uh, you know, they're not Chinese, you know, uh, there has been, a, so that's part of China, or uh, the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province, which is one of the richest provinces actually of China, huge, and they are not even related to the Chinese, to the major ethnic groups in the China, uh, they're, and they're Muslim. And they're Muslim, so it's a whole different group, and it's large, it's a huge group, the Uyghurs, and, and, and so on. But, so it's a diverse, it's a culturally, ethnically diverse uh, population, huge uh, state. And how about the political system? Well, obviously, the political system won't fit the models of uh, democracy we have discussed. Um, and because I told you that it is a quasi totalitarian slash authoritarian, it's in between uh, system, we could say. Uh, clearly, the state will be what? Will be unitary and centralized. That's the thing. Uh, you know, in order to have control of the population, authoritarian system, or totalitarian, you have to have a strong center of control. This is why um, uh, countries that are not, uh, that are authoritarian or totalitarian will tend to be not federal, but centralized, right, and unitary, right? Because it's this whole central chain of command. So China today is a, what we could characterize as a party state. Yeah? Uh, and we mentioned, uh, when we talked about party systems, this is one of those, uh, this is an example of a one-party system. Uh, because there's one party that dominates the entire system and there's no rival. And even if there are some smaller uh, parties that are accepted, it's not, they're not opposition, they're just, you know, fake, you know, uh, uh, alternatives, not really. Not even that. But there's the, there's the Communist Party which runs the state. And we'll see how uh, this happens. So, um, why is the party? Why is there one party and why is the party running the state? Because, again, China is based on one ideology. And according to this ideology, you have to bring about a change of society and a change of thinking and a change of human nature, basically. Uh, but who's going to bring it about? Well, those who are enlightened enough to know how to do this, right? And who are those? It's the party. The party, the Communist Party, is the elite who is enlightened enough to bring about change, to bring about, to, to take the people to, the, to this path towards utopia, you know. Uh, this is why the party controls the state. This is why there's no democracy. Because once you know the final solution, the final answer to everything, uh, to everything I, accent, I emphasize, you know, the alternative is not relativism. I'm not, you know, liberal democracy doesn't mean relativism. They're still right and wrong. The point is, here it's an universal, it's, a, it's an ideology that attempts to universally explain everything uh, and absolutely explain everything, and also use the violence to to attain those goals. Uh, so the party is the elite that knows the path. You know, well obviously they, there is no blueprint, right? So it's who who will actually. Uh, you know, you have Marxist writings and whatever, but <laughs> that's not a blueprint. It doesn't tell you how to govern China in the uh, 21st century. So what you have is uh, the elite within the elite, which is the party leadership, who are going to set the direction for the party. Right? And so what... And all this in the interest of whom? Of the people, of course. Right? Because that's the idea. You're going to liberate the people, you're going to end class warfare, um, uh, you are going to create an egalitarian uh, society. For whom? For the people, for the working class, right? But it's not the people who lead this, but the elites. Because <laughs> only they know. And their job is to change the way of thinking of the people, and to change the relationships, of economic relationships in the country, to create, uh, to bring about a change of culture and a change of 
life uh, view uh, and uh, uh, a change of society that brings about you know communist society where there's no more property and so on and so on. Um, so the party, this is why the party is in charge and not the party but the leadership. So something that starts from it's in the interest of the people that we're doing this actually ends up to be the top elite dictates the path. So it's very interesting uh, paradox here. So let's see how this works. Uh, you know, you will, uh, any modern state right, will need to have the institutions of a modern state. Uh, meaning an executive that governs and that provides security, as I said, you know, economic, uh, physical, and so on. Second, this is the People's Republic of China. So basically, the, the government needs to have a justification uh, based on a popular mandate. Now, but it's not even democracy. So it's not democracy the way, or they would say it's true democracy. They would say it is true democracy. We would, we, I mean, we. Uh, from a liberal democracy perspective, we would say it is not because uh, in a liberal democracy the, the, the mandate comes directly from the people through elections. So the system is based on, we will we'll have to have an executive because it will need to implement policies, it will need to have um, an elected legislature because it needs to be based on a popular mandate. So it will have that as well, and you will see how. But on the other hand, it also needs to guide that popular decision-making, just like in Iran, remember, you have all those institutions, the leader, the council of guardians, who guide the people's will. This is why it's the Islamic Republic of Iran, right? So you have a check on the people's will. It, it, it orients it, it filters it, it selects which will of the people we accept. Same here. So this is why you will have a, a separate uh, structure of the party, because it's the party who is the vanguard who leads the entire society, right? So you'll have an executive, you'll have a, a legislative system that needs to have a popular mandate, but you'll also have a political uh, a party, sorry, a, a party structure that will have to efficiently govern this institution. So in Iran, if you remember, we have half of the institutions of the political system are have their mandate from the uh, not don't have a popular mandate, but it's a religious mandate, right? Uh, so this, their source of legit legitimacy is what? Uh, the ideology, the latter faqih, uh, basically uh, Khomeini's interpretation of Islam. So that's the source of legitimacy for the leader, for the council of guardians, and whatever, right? It's Islam, but their interpretation. And the other half is popular. The same thing you'll see in, in the Chinese political system. This is why it's worth looking at the structure because you'll have something resembling a normal, quote-unquote, normal political system with a popular mandate, but then you also have to have the ideological check on that. So it will not be a pure popular mandate, as we'll see, but it will be an ideologically checked and guided popular mandate. So let's see, let's see how this works. So as I said, the, the political system does have a legislature, and that is the National People's Congress. The National People's Congress. Which, guess what, is elected. And according to the Constitution of China, it is the highest authority in the state. So, okay, so suddenly we have what? A parliamentary democracy, right? We'll see. Uh, but, notice that in order to be, you know, in order to be efficient, there are some traits that these institutions need to have. Well, this National People's Congress has 3,000 members and it meets um, um, <laughs> it meets uh, only for two weeks every year. They're elected for five years, uh, but it meets only two weeks every year and there are 5,000 of them. So how efficient can this legislature be? Obviously not, right? So uh, it only needs two weeks a year. So then you have a National People's um, Congress, a National People's Congress standing committee. Standing committees. You will see standing committees throughout the system. What are these standing committees? They are smaller bodies of smaller institutions within a larger institution who perform the institution, the, the functions of the larger institution on an ongoing basis. So the standing committee <coughs> is 
the, the, the institution that actually performs the functions that constitutionally belong to the National People's Congress. Uh, so the National People's Congress has a standing committee who are always standing, right? Always there and active, right? And performing the duties of the National People's Congress. And remember, the National People's Congress, as you see, needs to approve the Prime Minister, elects the President, and all these, like in the parliamentary system, it's a very powerful body on paper. Not on paper, it's, I mean, also, in fact, if there's a standing committee, actually, uh, elected by things, uh, who performs on a day-to-day -day basis the, their functions, right? Um, and this is not enough, but I'll get back here in a, in a second. Uh, then, uh, let's go to the executive. There is a president, the head of state, the president who is only head of state, okay? There's a president who is only head of state who is elected for five-year terms, uh, for, for um, five-year long term, two mandates, just head of state, so his, his role is formal, ceremonial, and he is again, uh, elected by the National People's Congress, okay? Then there is a Prime Minister and a Cabinet, very large Cabinet, with Ministers and whatever sub-Ministers. So, what you see here is, really looks like a parliamentary system, right? It, his, appoint, uh, his appointment needs to be approved by the uh, National People's Congress, well, you know, just like in a, in a parliamentary system, the same with the Ministers and so on. But remember, once again, let's step back. These are functions that the National People's Congress does not perform. It's the standing committee that performs. But you're going to say, well, okay, still, it's an elected body. But here's the trick. How do elections happen? Are they free and fair? Well, guess what? All the candidates are approved by the party. So it's basically a selected list of candidates uh, approved by the party, and about 60% uh, of the members here are actually members of the Communist Party. Not all of them are members of the Communist Party, right? But in the national legislature, quote-unquote, 60% or so, or 40%, or a large uh, proportion is, are members of party, and so Same with the elections here. These people who get elected to be actually exercising these important functions of the National People's Congress, again, then themselves, they themselves, are selected, pre-selected. So you get the, the, the ballot to vote, but the names have been chosen, basically. It's one guy. <laughs> Maybe two, but both of them chosen. Um, and the same here. They don't really elect the president. They're given the, 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 the name has been pre-selected. And you see this looks similar to the way in which the Council of Guardians and the leader, the Council of Guardians and the leader in Iran, uh, select and approve the candidates running for uh, the legislature there. Why? Because in both cases you have an ideology that checks on the popular mandate. The people don't really know what's, what's good for them, right? We have, the final, we have the final answer, we have the ideologies, or we have the ideological check in the Iran's case. It doesn't have the final answer, but... So you can choose, you have, you can choose but within a certain range, yeah? Um, and the same here, and the same with this quote-unquote approval. All these names, all these things that look like elections, all the things that need to, be, to go from bottom up, you know, popular mandate, are actually top down. Because it's people on the top who are actually the true source of power. The true, um, the mandate doesn't come from here, it comes from the top. It's the top that gives uh, the mandate to these people. The top chooses who's going to be here, and then who's going to be here, and uh, these, when elections happen, it's only a, a choice between already selected choices, right? The mandate usually has to have to go from, you know, from the people to the other institutions, and like in a parliamentary system, but it's actually top-down. These are the bosses in, in many ways, and these are in the lower rung, and so on. So the mandate is top-down. This the source of power is at the top, not at the bottom, which is ironic, right? But why? Because the top, but the top not here, by the way. I'm just pointing it, but that's not where the top is, and I'm going to show it to you in a second. But why the top? Because, again, com uh, com in communism, right, in an ideological system, it, who is deciding what is the right interpretation of the ideology, right? In the U.S. is the Constitutional Court, because we, you know, it's like the legal scholars in, in Iran, right? They know the fundamental law, right? In an ideological system, it's, well, the leaders of the party because it's the party who is the enlightened elite and who can be more enlightened than the leader of the party. Now, 
human nature being what it is, those leaders got there by eliminating their own rivals. So they're not there because they're more enlightened. But it's this idea that like they have this prophetic mission in a way. Um, okay, so Prime Minister, as I said, approved by the National People's Congress, the Minister is approved by the National People's Congress, and so on. And then you have a bureaucracy that goes throughout the country, uh, you know, just like in any uh, uh, other country. But this again uh, is um, um, the, you know, the apparent uh, structure uh, of the, um, you know, polit uh, state system, the, the political system, because the true center of power is here. And here, if this is the state, this is the party. And you will see how interesting, uh, how interesting it is that the party will um, have a similar structure. There is a, a legislature, actually, which is the National Party Congress, Oh, this is the National People's Congress, this is the National Party Congress, which is the National Congress of the members of the party. And just like the National People's Congress, it's very large, so too large to be mean anything, 2,000 people. And it meets, pay attention, every five years. So that's not something that's going to govern the party, right? But again, it's this fake idea that, oh no, it's the people in the party. It's the party itself which gives the direction to the party. No, no. it's the elites. But that's the, the ideology is that, no, 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 the party, the people in the party give the direction of the, of the thing. Well, because this is so large and it has important powers, national, because power is with the people, right, here, and with the members of the party here, no. Because they meet only every five years, someone needs to exercise the powers given to the National Party Congress. You know, powers like approving the direction of the party, implicit in the direction of the country. Powers like choosing the leaders of the party. Well, if you meet every five years, you're not going to be able to do that. So you will have a sort of a standing committee, right, which here is called a central committee. Right? A central committee. And the central committee is the same thing. Um, it's it's uh, quote-unquote elected by a national party congress <clears throat> for, for uh, five years, and uh, they meet uh, more often. They meet more often. Um, they have a plenary session once a year, but still not very often. But still, you know, at least once a year, a plenary session, and then they have, you know, more uh, constant presence. Uh, but again, not continued, continuous. And also, notice that the co central committee, and this is very important, actually kind of meets, this is the body where it's about 300 people, two, two 300 people. This is where all the most important, powerful people in the country are actually have a seat here. And what does this remind you of? Well, this should remind you of the expediency council. If you remember from Iran, which was this appointed body <clears throat> where all the more important people in the country, governors and members in the cabinet and the religious leaders and people from the assembly of experts and from the council of guardians, it was, uh, were appointed there uh, by the leader. So it's a sort of a, uh, you know, a source, a pillar of power. Because if you have all the most important people in, a, in, a, in, a, in one uh, institution, you can control them, and you create a network of relationship with, relationships with them, right? It's the same principle based on which the, the parliament, the, the parliament was invented. Parliament was invented to a degree in, uh, in uh, England uh, with the Magna Carta, if you remember, we talked about this 13th century. Why? Because the king wanted to have all, the, have all the more powerful nobles meet together, so when he takes decisions, he takes them takes the decisions with them, which ensures him of their support. So when he was proposed that taxes are levied for some war or some, so, uh, so on, and that proposal will be brought in front of the quote-unquote parliament, if the nobles approve this, it's their own decision, so they become your supporters. So this is how you ground your, your rule. You ground your rule on local power holders. That's, it's a similar principle, I'm not saying it's the exact same, but it's a similar principle both here and in the Expediency Council um, uh, of um, uh, Iran. Okay, but again, they just meet, you know, in plenary session just once a year, uh, still not, you know, there. So, <clears throat> who's actually running the party? Well, um, the, the Central Committee um, elects a Politburo. PB, which is not peanut butter. 
Politburo. Uh, again, check the spelling and everything in their textbook. Politburo. This is the top of the institutional structure of the of the party, not the utmost top, but so it's elected um, by CC, and it's only so these these are about you know let's say 200, you know, 200 300 members. This is twenty members. Okay, so you see smaller group, right? And the Politburo um, meets once monthly, you know. So again, not continuous, right? So, but still, once monthly. And it's only 20 people, they know each other. Elected, quote-unquote, by the Central Committee, or about 200. But, again, only once a month, so you need something. You probably need a standing committee, you guessed right. There's the standing committee of the Politburo, was only nine people and this is it. This is the top of the pops. This is the, the, the apex of the uh, uh, Chinese political power and system. Because these nine people are the most powerful people in the country. And then there's a general secretary who is one of them. Yeah, that's it. So this is the apex of power and everything else flows from here. And guess what? The people in the PB and the people in the CC are actually what? Members here. They're ministers. The prime minister is actually, and the prime president always comes from the, sort of from the standing committee of the uh, uh, PB. Uh, people from here are also here. Uh, all these elections, as I said, the candidates are selected. Who do you think selects them? These bodies here. You know, the, the, this is the source of legitimacy. Is the supreme committee. This is the, the source who selects them every single individual downward. They will select them. They will select them so on. So this is how this is how it's centralized because it all comes from the vanguard and the leadership of the party. How do they control the state? Because all of these institutions are selected and run by the party. The members here are members of the party. If not everyone, they're selected by the party. Throughout the administration, um, uh, throughout the administration, there's uh, to, to, in order to occupy a uh, a position, you would need to get the approval of the local party organization because there is a local party organization just like you have a bureaucracy. So the local party organization governs a, a, a province and governs the administration there. You know, it's the party who rules locally, it's the party who rules nationally. Either by having their own, you know, all these institutions, the state is occupied. The state is run by the party, that's the point. All these positions, you know, people here are also here, you know. Why? Because it's the party who uses the instruments of the state. So I started with this, but this is the structure of power. And then these are the tools of power, right? So you see how it's not a democratic system. You see how the mandate is not a popular mandate coming from the people, because it actually comes from top down. Um, me meanwhile, you also obviously have the People's Liberation Army, we talked about this, right? We have police and secret police and whatever. Uh, you have uh, labor camps and, and all this penal system and, and uh, um, you know, of, of police and secret police that penetrates the entire uh, country and so on. So, all these institutional tools of, the, of whom? Of the party to run the state. So, how does the party control the state? Well, first of all, all the, these quasi institutions of the all these institutions of the quasi political system are actually run, uh, selected by the party, right? The party leadership. Uh, they have the, the tools of violence, just like in Iran. It's very important that in a in a non democratic system, the tools of violence, the sort of you know power ministries, uh, which force ministries, which are what police, army, secret police, judiciary. These are the power ministries, right? Well, any ideological system wants to take control of the instruments of power first, right? I, I said that, you know, the ideologies use the institutions of the modern state to do whatever. Well, what institutions? Not the kindergarten, although that too. What they use is, the first of all, the institutions that give them control. And what are the institutions that give them control? Are the institutions that have the right and obligations to use violence, the, who have the legal rights to use violence, and those are what? Police, army, and so on. This is why it's important, and I mentioned this is a requirement of a democracy for uh, the army to be led by a civilian in a democracy, you know, uh, an elected representative.
because the army is a dangerous thing. Just like you know, any um, any institution that is has the right and the freedom to use violence needs to be very carefully regulated and led uh, and accountable. But you see how it happens. Uh, <coughs> now, um, so. They dominate the institutions of the political system, they also dominate the institutions of the administration. Um, the so-called nomenclatura system, right, where we should write it. Uh, nomenclatura, nomenclature, is basically a system by which all positions in, in the administration, and throughout the system, all the top positions, all the leadership positions are based basically on a party made list. So there's a list of people who are reliable and who are, you know, names are added and so on and they're the, the cadre, they're the, there's the, they're the, you know, um, uh, member list, so to speak, of those who are reliable enough to appoint in positions of leadership. And guess what? Well, that again is top down. The top, you know, has this list and then, you know, goes lower and there are, these, there are these selected people who are approved by different levels of party uh, leadership to, yeah, yeah, he's a reliable guy, he's, he's one of us, he's going to follow the line of the party and so on. So the party has a hold on, this, hold on the society because it controls the tools of violence, it controls the political institutions, it controls the institutions of the state and then with the nomenclature, nomenclatura system, it controls everything because throughout there it's a network of people who are, even if they're not members of the party, they are uh, obedient to it or listening to it, uh, controllable. And the same uh, downwards here. So what can look like a, a popular mandate is actually obviously a top-down mandate. So why isn't it a liberal democracy, right? Well, free and fair elections, right? Remember the criteria for liberal dem democracy, free and fair elections. Are there free and fair? No. Right. And we always see why. Um, the second criteria, um, uh, rule of law. Well, rule of law is not, you know, remember that it, the law needs to apply to everyone. Does it apply to everyone? No. There is a certain degree of immunity as the higher you go in the party, although more recently some of the major, some major party members have been tried for corruption. Obviously, there's a huge degree of corruption in a system that is not accountable. Um, so, but is there a rule of law perfectly? No. Because the party controls the judiciary. You know, because rule of law also needs to have a law that is to, a system of law that functions and a system of law that is actually rational and democratic, right? So law that it has, it, it, uh, is independent from uh, ideology and parties and so on. Well, not from ideologies, but from parties and, 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 and government, right? So a system of law that is rational um, and, and uh, Passed democratically. Well, in this case, it's not true because both the way the law is made, right? Who makes the laws? This body, right? Remember, this is the legislature. So they pass all laws. They pass all decisions of the government. This is the political system. The problem is that it, most of these decisions are yes, 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 yes. Do you agree? Sure, sure. A few no's. Recently, more recently, there are more no's, but very few. Right? So it doesn't do its job. But this is a legislature and they need to pass all laws, just like in any, any other legislature. This is the executive. It governs day-to-day -day country, right? Only that it's top-down. Um, so, is there a rule of law? No, because the judiciary is controlled uh, top-down, right? And the party has influence even over the judiciary, of course. So, no rule of law. What is the third criterion? Um, civil rights civil and political rights and liberties. Now, obviously, this is where we you know, have problems. You know, freedom of speech. Well, actually, the internet is uh, controlled by the government, literally. Uh, I, someone told me a story with um, sending an email from China. They sent an email from China, and actually, not all attachments came through. <laughs> not because they forgot to attach. The, the email is filtered. So first, it gets to, to the censorship office, and they approve it, and then it goes forward. So obviously, so or things like uh, in China, you can't just go on Google. There's no Google in China, you know. Or uh, Yahoo uh, was allowed to, to 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 be there. It was a huge scandal because Yahoo agreed to actually censor. Yahoo exactly actually agreed to play with the government and not actually be a free search engine. Yeah, 
so you know, for money. Um, so, is there civil rights for liberties? Obviously, no, especially political liberties. You know, in terms of economy, again, as I said, it's not totalitarian in the sense that in the economy you can be an enterpriser, you can become rich, but just don't get, don't even try to question the regime. How long can you keep this tension between an economy that moves towards a more, you know, entrepreneurial economy and a system that doesn't have competition or... We'll see. Um, so the third one, civil and political rights and liberties, no. Fourth one, limited and accountable government, well, haha, -ha, no, of course, right? Government is not limited, it controls all aspects of your life from church to everything. Uh, you know, some churches, uh, religions, are, religions are banned and, uh, you know, they need to have an underground church and so on. Um, and, and in general, all aspects of life are not as bad as in Mao's time when literally all aspects of your life entire population had to go out and exercise in the morning, you know, they all had to dress in a certain way. That's the Titanic regime. Well, not in this case, um, but uh, not anymore that, that, to that degree, but clearly, you know, uh, there's an ideological control uh, or check on all aspects of the life. Uh, so limited government, no, because it reaches into everything. Famous one-child policy. It regulates how many children you can have. You can only have one child. Well, that's not a limited government. Is it accountable government? Well, no, although it's, there are some inklings and there's, there, are, there are huge revolts, there are continuous uprisings in China. They're not, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, the media, especially our media, is, is very little, gives us very little exposure uh, to, to uh, to events around the world, but you know, every year there are tens and uh, tens of, of uprisings in different provinces in China. They're very local, right? But you know, they they beat up the local party, party functionaries and whatever, because people are fed up with corruption and so on. But all this repressive apparatus, well, it's inefficient enough to, to squelch such things. So, is there an accountable government? Well, this is because of this popular discontent, especially because of corruption and economic problems. Uh, and local party bureauc bureaucrats who behave like bosses and little, little dictators and corrupt, um, they, uh, the judiciary system has had some uh, recent uh, checks on, obviously they were allowed to do so, uh, on even some, uh, I think it was a member of uh, the Politburo who actually got to, uh, thrown into jail. Maybe even executed because you know the death penalty there is applied heavily um, because of corruption. So clearly not a liberal democracy. But just like in um, Iran, as I mentioned, you, you we can divide this whole political system in what in two in a way, right? And here you have something that looks like a popular mandate, right? Except for these, of course. And here you see how something that is what an ideological mandate, right? So the two sources of legitimacy, this is popular legitimacy, this is ideological legitimacy. Now, in theory at least, right, and in terms of structure, because in fact this is the one that dominates. Same in Iran. You have popular legitimacy, although there the elections are much freer in Iran. You, you know, they're actually elections. But you have uh, in Iran as well, right, an ideological level with the... Um, "Quote unquote Islamic source of authority, uh, which is the leader, the uh, council prime and so on, um, and one that is popular. Same here. You see that the very system of institutions reflects the, the non-democratic nature, because what is the essence of democracy, right or wrong? We we're just studying it, right? Is that the whole institutional uh, political system needs to have a popular." Why? Because the idea is that the people, quote-unquote, govern themselves. Good. This uh, concludes, actually, our uh, democratic and non-democratic system, uh, which we started with, actually, a discussion of ideologies and parties and party systems, and then what is democracy, what, what types of democratic, uh, what criteria there are for democracy, then some types of non-democratic systems, and two case studies of uh, Iran and China.